Hello, and welcome to In the Word, a ministry of miracles in action with Dr. Larry Yates. The message you are about to hear, if diligently applied, will absolutely change your life. So grab your Bible, notebook, and pen, and get ready to take notes. Because I'm praying that the Lord Jesus Christ will give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, thereby allowing the eyes of your understanding to be in life. Well, glory. I'm going to ask you, if you have your Bibles, to turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 6, and verse 9. In our time together today, I want to take you to what Jesus said in reference to prayer. Notice in Matthew's account of Jesus' words here in Matthew 6, starting at verse 9, Jesus said, And after this manner, therefore, pray ye, or after this manner, therefore, pray. Now, I want you to stop right there for a moment. How many of you believe that Jesus Christ is the one who can really teach us how to pray? I want you to notice that in your Bibles, these words are written in red ink. You know what that means? It means they were spoken from the very lips of our Lord. When God planted this message in my heart, I was in a place of deep frustration in my spiritual life. I was adopted into a Christian family. I was raised in church. We were there every time the doors were open. Later on in life, I attended Bible college and finally six years of postgraduate seminary. I thought I had everything I needed for success in ministry, but I was struggling desperately in my prayer life. I was crying out to God, Lord, I have the desire to pray, but I need the discipline to pray. I simply didn't know how to pray. How many of you have the desire to pray, but will admit you need the discipline to pray and the knowledge on how to pray effectively? That's what we're going to pray today. We're going to ask the Lord to just baptize us in his discipline. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. After this manner, therefore, Pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And I'm going to read the next two verses because they are so important. Verse 14, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. I'd like for you to notice that there are seven basic parts of the Lord's Prayer that correspond to seven basic needs of the human spirit. As you begin to pray the way Jesus taught us to pray, the Lord will begin to meet each one of these seven basic needs. Jesus tells us, pray this way. And I'm here to tell you that when you begin to do this, the Lord will begin to meet every need of your life because the basic needs of your heart are all covered right here. Watch this. The first need is a foundational need shared by every human being. That is a paternal need. That is the need to know God as Father. One of the greatest needs that you have today, whether you realize it or not, is to have a healthy relationship, not with God out there somewhere, but with God as your merciful, kind, and loving Heavenly Father. Now, that may not be a big deal to you, but it was a big deal to Jesus. Jesus exemplified in the flesh what the Father is in reality. When he said, I and my Father are one, he was saying far more than what the modern church teaches. The Jews understood exactly what he was saying, and they took up stones to stone him. I promise you that there is more in this verse than is understood by 95% of the church world. Jesus was helping us to experience God in a totally new way. 
the world and even many in the church have never seen God as a merciful, kind, gracious, loving, and even when necessary, dying Heavenly Father. That is how I begin my prayer time every morning. My Father in Heaven. And this may indeed be a little difficult for some people. Not all of us have been able to say we had a good relationship with our earthly father. Thankfully, I was blessed. That's not true of everyone. And for you, learning how to relate to God as your father may be a bit of a challenge. See, our whole society struggles with this, and it's caused incalculable pain and suffering for millions. But let me tell you the good news about that. Psalm 27 verse 10 says that when my father and mother have forsaken me, the Lord will take me in. But I have more good news. It's never too late to come to know God as your father. What you need to understand doesn't come except by revelation knowledge. If you want to know what the father is like, look to Jesus. He is the father manifest in the flesh. So, if you struggle in this area, begin your prayer this way. Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And just begin by faith to magnify God as your heavenly father. And you know what will happen to you? God will start giving you revelation on who he really is. Get ready. It just might blow your mind. God is your father. How many can think about that and just praise him for that revelation? I think we ought to just acknowledge him right now. God, I thank you that you are my father. Help me come to understand what that really means for me. See, one day as I prayed this prayer, I suddenly realized I was no longer talking to God way off up there somewhere, like I said earlier. I was talking to my father who loves me as his very own. Notice that it's the very first part, and I believe the overarching truth of the entire prayer. If we don't get this part right, we'll miss the true depth of all that follows. This is where it all starts, our Father which art in heaven. And then he says, Hallowed be thy name. This is the second need of your spiritual being, the presence need, the need for the presence of God. How many of you need the presence of God in your life right now more than you ever have before? As we get closer and closer to the end of time, we're going to realize how truly precious and pr the presence of God really is. I'm going to give you a formula right now that's a truly biblical formula, and I challenge you to try this. The next time you go to prayer, don't start off by focusing on your need. Don't focus on your family's needs, the church's needs, or anyone else's needs. Start off your prayer time by focusing on the blood of Jesus. The reason I say that is that when God gave me this revelation on prayer, I had a very deep spiritual experience. It was something completely new and unfamiliar to me. I can only describe it as sort of a vision. I pray that doesn't offend any of you here, all it reveals about me, according to Joel, is that I'm a young man. But in my mind, as I began to pray, I saw the Lord Jesus. He was walking, and he had a gold basin in his hand. He came to a beautiful altar with brilliant, immutable light behind it, and he began to pour the contents of that basin upon that altar. It was his blood, and it covered and ran down the altar. But here's the significant part. As soon as that blood hit the altar, it began to speak. It began to declare that I was welcome in the very presence of God. It began to declare that my sins were forgiven. It began to declare that I had access into the Holy of Holies by that blood. Then I remember that verse in Hebrews 10:19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest of all by the blood of Jesus. You all came to church uh, on Sunday in a vehicle. But the vehicle whereby you go into the presence of God is not your crying or struggling or even your straining and travail and trying to believe. It's in your being able to rest 
in the finished work of Christ. Hear this word and believe that on the altar of God, the altar in heaven, we have an altar and that altar has blood on it. That blood, according to the writer of Hebrews, is blood that speaks. It's speaking blood. You say, what do I mean by that? The writer of the book of Hebrews in chapter 12, verse 24, speaks of uh, blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. From the very first murder, when Cain murdered his brother Abel, every man's blood is spoken because the life of man is in his blood. When a man dies, his blood cries out for something. It cries out for vengeance. It cries out for mercy. When the Son of God died, His blood was shed, and His blood is eternal blood, forever crying out to you that you are welcome into the holiest of all to come boldly before the throne of God. And for that, I challenge you today, when you pray, start by just saying, Lord, You are my Father. I come before You. I come into Your presence. Listen, as you begin to pray this way consistently, It will become the secure foundation of everything that goes on in your life from that point forward. You'll experience His manifest presence in your daily life. Boy, I want you to have this in your life, in the life of your family, the life of your church. We have a minister friend in Tennessee that's also an Elvis impersonator. He looks and sings just like Elvis Presley, but he ministers under a powerful anointing. Last year, he had the privilege and opportunity to travel to the White House and meet President Trump. I thought to myself, wow, that was a great honor to meet the President of the United States. But then I heard the Holy Spirit say in my heart, son, that is a great honor. But boy, it's a greater honor to come before the King of the universe every day and just spend time in his presence. Once we are in His presence, the third thing, the third need of the human spirit, when we get there, we're not just there to worship and praise the Lord as important as that is. It's a wonderful thing and He loves it. But we get there in order to do some kingdom business. The third of our seven points of prayer is we begin to declare, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. This next part of the prayer is where we set in order kingdom priorities, the priority part of the prayer. How many of you struggle with keeping your priorities straight? You won't if you'll start doing what I'm teaching you today. God will work a miracle in your life as he did in mine. I was a seminary graduate in full-time ministry. My wife and I had a brand new baby we were blessed to have adopted, Kimmy. I was on staff at our local church. We were really doing great things for God in our local community. But I was struggling all the time keeping my priorities straight. And the Lord, when he gave me this, it fixed it for me. He said, you begin to declare when you enter into my presence, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done over the prioritized order of your life. And I will begin supernaturally by my spirit to show you how to line up your life according to the kingdom of God. Folks, when we say thy kingdom come, we're talking about inner order. When we say thy will be done, we're talking about outer order. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy on the inside. His will be done is what God wants us to do in the world. It's like the rudder of a ship that determines its direction and destination. In the same way, your tongue is the rudder of your life. We set the rudders of our lives correctly to take us where we want to go. When you get up every morning and enter into his presence by the blood of Jesus, then you begin to declare, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in my life today. When you say, Lord Jesus, your king, come and sit on the throne of my life, 
come and sit right here. As you begin to declare this, first of all, over your own life, then declare it over your family. You see, I've learned the hard way that if I don't have me right, I really can't help my family. First, pray it over you. Then you'll be ready to pray for your family. I'm not with my family for hours, sometimes days, but I, I know they're going to be all right because I have declared the will of God be done in their lives. We've got to learn how to put our foot down for our families. I think it's high time we learned how to declare the will of God for our children, our families, our mamas and daddies, our in-laws and extended families. The Lord showed me that if we'll begin to do this in prioritized order, start with you. And the way that I do that is just stay in his presence. And I declare, Lord, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done over my life until I just know that he's, he's sitting on the throne of my heart and that no matter what happens to me all day long, it's going to work out for the glory of the kingdom of God. Because I declared, Thy kingdom come. Now, let me get this down in your spirit. It's not in any way that we're begging, saying, Lord, please do something that he really doesn't want to do. It's us getting into agreement with what he's already promised to do. How many of you really believe that God does have a kingdom he wants us to be a part of? See, God doesn't look down every morning when you get up and wonder what he's going to do with you that day. No, he's already decided before you were even born exactly what he wants to do with your life. He simply has to wait for us to figure that out and get on board with it. He's already got a plan. He just needs you to stop long enough to say, Thy will be done in my life today. Declare this every morning, this day, Thy will be done in my life. See, the way your life is built is not in big events. It's built on little victories and all of the little things that will give you what it takes to make it through the big challenges. This right here is the most effective Bible way to do it. You're just not going to get it any other way. Listen, if you ignore what I'm teaching, and I've said this often, you can sit in a great church, but you won't change. But if you'll do what I'm teaching you, You'll begin to open up the arteries of your real heart, your spirit, that may have been clogged for a long time, daily opening them a little more, and your whole spirit will begin to open up more and more, releasing the anointing in your life in greater and greater measure. Your whole being comes alive. Why? Because your inner man is finally getting the lifeblood of the spirit that it needs to function as God designed it. I do this every day. You know, I just want to stop right here, and I don't want to say praise the Lord. I want to say, wow. Begin to declare this every morning directly over yourself, your family, your church, and this nation. We're not going to talk right now about our nation. The threat is real. The need is clear, and we'd be here all night on that topic, but... People, please, please, please pray for your pastor. The Apostle Paul was in prison at the notorious Mamertine prison in Rome from where he wrote many of his epistles. In one of them he said, I'm going to make it because of two things, your prayers and the supply of the Holy Spirit. He said, the way I'm going to make it through is through your prayers. Years ago, Jimmy's told a pastor friend of mine in the 80s that one of the reasons for his moral failure is because he refused to let people pray for him. People would travel to Baton Rouge and tell him, the Lord has told me to come and pray for you, but he would not accept their prayers. Folks, pray for me. I need your prayers. My family needs your prayers. But more importantly, pray for your pastor. He needs it. His family needs it. Every one of them is a prime target for the devil. If we have ever prayed for men and women of God, now is the time. Do it now. 
Do it now and every day. How many will declare, I'll do that? How many believe you can put your foot down daily and say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done? You're saying, what do I mean put your foot down? Well, the Greek verbs come and be done are better, better illustrated than exegeted. I could stand here for 30 minutes and explain what the verbs are, but that wouldn't mean as much to you as a simple illustration you'll never forget. What this means is like someone putting their foot down and saying, Come thy kingdom, be done thy will. That's what it means, literally. In the language of the text, the verbs come first and with force. Lord, let it come today. It's a forceful declaration that all day long, nothing but the will of God is going to be done in your life, your family's life, your church's life, and the life of this nation. You see what I mean when I say pray in prioritized order? You, your family, your church, and finally your nation, so that as Paul said, we can live quiet and peaceful lives. See, it's not enough simply to be anointed. It must become rivers of living water flowing out and touching others. That's the third thing. First, the paternal need. Secondly, the presence need. Thirdly, the priority need. And then fourthly, the provision need. How many of you believe that Jesus meant it when he told us to pray, give us this day our daily bread? I mean, he didn't just put that line in there just for fun. It wasn't a suggestion when he said for us to pray this way. It was a command. Folks, how many of you know that it takes more bread today than ever before in our lives? It just costs more to live in this world. But I'm here to announce to you today that God is not having a recession. There's no lack to his supply. Oh, I pray everyone here will catch this and do it for the rest of your life. Consider, for example, Philippians 4.19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You need to realize that the promises of God are not automatic. They have to be prayed in. Give us this day our daily bread. The Lord showed me that when people get their lives right, they come under the authority of the local church and they are faithful in their giving if they'll have balanced work habits and balanced rest habits. Once you get your life in a posture where you're not idle, you're resting, you're under the authority of the church and you're giving the way the Lord told you to give. You just give it without fear. You do it with joy, with a sense of abandonment, knowing that what you'll sow, you'll reap back, knowing that when you give, it'll be given back to you. How many of you know that this is for real? That the law of God's law of supply is in effect for you? Now listen to this. This is something you're probably not doing. You've got to be able to say, now, Lord, my life is in line. I've got kingdom priorities working in my life. And, and now, Lord Jesus, I'm asking you for your provision, your kind of biblical prosperity on my life. I'm asking you to do it, Lord. And then specifically present to God your need. And let me also say this to the pastors out there for the sake of the church. Begin, folks, to present daily the needs of the church. Something we have begun to do is keep a budget each month. And when we began to do that and pray over it daily, we began to see those needs to be met supernaturally. It's amazing how when we did our part, God began to meet that budget month by month. It worked in our life, and I promise it will work in yours. Do it with the church finances, and it will work the exact same way. Prove me wrong. Present each need specifically every day, and watch what God will do. Jesus said clearly in Matthew 9, 11 that we are to pray, Give us this day our daily bread. Think about this with me. 
How many of you will admit that this is something you simply don't do? You, you don't pray specifically over your need and say, Lord, this is what I need and when. Could it be an important reason that your needs are not consistently being met? We have not because we ask not. The next need is the pardon part. This might just be the single most important part of the prayer, so please hear this. What makes me say this is the single most important part of the prayer? The reason is clear from the very words of Jesus immediately following the prayer. Look carefully again with me at Jesus' words in Matthew 9, 14 and 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive yours. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. This is the part of the prayer where you really need to keep your heart right before the Lord. This is the part of the prayer where, to paraphrase, we say to him, Lord, forgive me my sins as I in the same way forgive those who sin against me. How many of you last week had to confess one sin to God? How many had to confess two sins? We'll stop right there, all right? Let me ask it a different way. How many of you need that part of the prayer almost every day? I know I do. I need every day to say, Father, please forgive me that. I always try to keep my account clear with God. We have his assurance that in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Lord never says, as we are prone to do, well, I'll forgive them, but I'll never forget it. Aren't you glad that when you confess it, he wipes it away as if it never happened? I want to keep my record clear with God. We ought to thank the Lord for that gift. I confess it, he forgives and forgets it, and we get to get up and keep moving forward. He said that he forgives as we are willing to forgive others. Jesus gave a parable in Matthew 18 about a man who had been forgiven a great debt, and he turned around and refused to give another of a much smaller debt. Remember that? That man would not forgive, and his master turned him over to the tormentors. The reason I say that this is the most important part of the prayer is because this is the only part of the prayer that Jesus re-emphasizes. It's like this. Jesus is teaching his disciples that when they pray, they are to follow this outline. He gave them this outline during the Sermon on the Mount. Interestingly enough, two years later, after Jesus had told Martha that she was worried and troubled about many things and exhorted her that only one thing was really necessary, being in the presence of Jesus, listening to his word. As they journeyed on, the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, two years after giving his instructions, in answer to their request, Jesus gives the very same outline. It's almost as if he says to them, I guess you weren't listening the first time two years ago. And he gives them the same outline. I have nothing new to tell you. Pray this way. And as he walks away, he stops and turns and says, Hey, there's one more thing I want you to understand. If you forget everything else I've said about prayer, remember this. Always forgive, because if you don't forgive others, you'll be turned over to the tormentors. Many of us have proven this true in our own lives. We have held on to unforgiveness in our hearts, and we are tormented by thoughts of the wrong done to us and consumed with bitterness towards that person who has hurt us. I taught this at one church, and someone approached me afterwards, and they actually said to me, Dr. Yates, you have your degree in theology, you seem to know a lot about the Bible. Tell me, who do you think these tormentors are? Have you ever recognized when you're being set up? I get asked a lot of interesting questions. But see, I knew 
he was really asking if I thought a Christian could be afflicted with demons. And rather than buying into that, I simply said, Well, sir, I know this. Whoever they are, I don't want them. Do you? How many of you don't want the tormentors? That's why this is the most important part of the prayer. Think about it. How many of you know that even after you're saved, your flesh can be just as snide, ugly, and unforgiving as before? See, we're walking around in flesh bodies. This body was made of dirt, and dirt responds to dirt. When people throw their dirt at us, our first tendency is to throw dirt back. We think of a hundred things to say back to them, don't we? But now... Every morning in our place of prayer, we say, Father, forgive me of my sins, Lord. And Lord, I set my will right here and now to forgive those who trespass against me. I choose now to forgive them, no matter who they are or what they do. Just as you have forgiven me, I forgive them. It's a conscious decision you make each morning because if you wait until your dirt gets out there with theirs, it's too late. Your dirt will act just like everyone else's dirt. Aren't you tired of living like that? Now listen, this is important to understand. You probably won't change that person in that moment. But they won't get your joy. You'll walk away having reversed the curse that otherwise they would have placed on you. You'll walk away just blessing them, as Jesus said, bless them that curse you. I'd always wondered how to do that. Now I know. Here's the secret. When you bless someone who curses you, you cause that curse to boomerang. When they curse you and you curse back, you invoke the curse and take it in. The curse comes inside, as it were. But when you say, bless you and you mean it because you have chosen ahead of time to walk in forgiveness it's truly like the curse just bounces off of you and right back onto them this is how you're able to get along with everybody all the time this is why this is the most important part of the prayer because in today's world if you don't learn how to walk in forgiveness you will live a tormented life how many of you want to live free of torment? This is how you'll do it. It's so important. Every morning I say, Lord, I set my will to forgive. Please forgive me of my sins. That's the pardon part. Next is the power part. The power need of your spirit is met when you pray, Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. Hey, let's get real for a moment. God did not recreate us to walk around always beating demons off our heads. You'll never have time to think about Jesus because you're always flailing around beating devils off you all the time or struggling to control your flesh. Jesus said to pray, lead us not into temptation. Lord, if there's any other way that I can learn what I need to learn, please lead me that way. Most of us don't pray that way, and so we're constantly live in a state of temptation. You say, well, how do I keep temptation away? I'll tell you how. By daily putting on the armor of God. Jesus said that we are in a spiritual war. The Apostle Paul expounded and elaborated on this when he told us, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. He was talking to Christians, we it's a word to believers, to you and me. Our real war in life is never with other people. It's with spiritual powers in heavenly places. But if you want to win over them, put on the whole armor of God. See, the Bible says put on the whole armor of God and you'll overcome all the wiles or schemes of the devil. How many would like to live in that posture? Rather than the devil chasing you all the time, how about when he looks up and sees you coming, he runs the other way? Because putting on the armor is simply putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 6, Paul says it this way, 
loins girt about by truth. Say it with me. My loins are girt about with truth. Jesus, you are my truth. For who is Jesus? In John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Is Jesus the word? John 17 says, Sanctify them by the truth. Thy word is truth. Say it with me. I have on the breastplate of righteousness. Jesus, you are my righteousness. Say it with me. My feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Jesus, you are my peace. Say it with me. Above all, I take up the shield of faith, wherewith I will quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. I put on the helmet of salvation. Everyone just reach up and act like you're putting on that helmet. Let me ask you something. What is your helmet of salvation? Who is your salvation? Nobody else but Jesus. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Say it with me. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Dear God, let us raise our children like that. They need to grow up learning that it's real and okay to be spiritual. It's not weird to be a Christian. Jesus didn't come in to make us freaks. He came to take freaks and turn us into children of God. Paul said, do this and you'll overcome. Therefore, don't do it. You won't overcome. Can you see how important it is to put on the whole armor of God? And then the last part of the prayer is the praise part. This is where we say, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Let me say this one thing uh, about that and I'll close. The praise part of the prayer is so important because when you leave your prayer time, you need to be praising and magnifying God. The reason the Word records this all the way through the Bible, think about this, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. It's all the way through scriptures. Rejoice in the Lord always. In everything, give thanks. How many of you remember reading those words? They're not just nice poetic words to hang on your refrigerator or post on Facebook. They are there because praise is the language of faith. Listen carefully to this. This is big, big, big. This is huge. As long as you keep praising Him, everything you prayed about that morning remains activated. Praise continually activates and reinforces the previous six parts of the prayer and keeps them working all day long in your life. On the other hand, fear and negativity cancels out faith and renders you spiritually powerless. As they went forth praising, the Lord set ambushments against their enemies. All the way through Scripture, praise is directly related to victory. Why? Praise basically says, thank you. Hear it again. Praise is the language of faith. As long as you keep praising, you keep your faith active. Abraham was strengthened in his faith by glorifying God. Do you hear anything useful in all this? Oh, please, please get this. As long as you're praising God, you cannot be in unbelief. When you stop praising, or let me say it this way, ever been truly touched and blessed at church? And even before you get out of the parking lot, Satan trips you up. You get critical and negative. You fight over where to have lunch. You yell at the kids and lose your joy. If Satan can steal your joy and praise, he can defeat your faith. How can you fix that situation? Folks, I am not and never will be by any stretch of the imagination a good pastoral counselor. Why? I'm so glad you asked. This is my approach to pastoral counseling. You got a problem in the parking lot? Admit it, quit it, and forget it. But listen, God's not trying to get us to praise Him so we can become little Pentecostal automatons going around saying, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. The devil laughs, the world laughs. Is that all you've got? No, it's not. 
God wants us to praise him out of a sincere heart of faith because he is truly your father. And you can come into his presence every day. You can establish the kingdom of God through a clear and sincere declaration of your faith. You can pray in what you need and see those needs met. You can give and receive forgiveness as a rhythm of love. You can put on the whole armor of God in such a way that when the devil sees you coming, he runs the other way because he knows you are skilled with the sword. And you can lift your voice in praise, adoration, and honor to the one who alone is worthy. All day long, just be saying, yours is the kingdom. It's the Lord's kingdom. It's the Lord's power. It's the Lord's glory forever. It's Jesus' kingdom. It's all his. He alone deserves all praise. All day long, just continue to praise him. And if you find yourself slipping back into negativity, just stop right there and say, hey, I'm not going to deactivate my faith. I'm not going to let the devil steal my joy, steal my blessing. And you get up, dust yourself off, and keep moving forward, praising God for his provision and blessing. And then the next morning, you get up and you do it again. I'd rather do this than watch basketball. I'd rather do this than watch football. I'd rather do this than watch Young and the Senseless. I'd rather do this than anything in the world, and I mean anything. This needs to become the most important thing in our lives, sitting at the feet of Jesus and enjoying his presence. Because every good thing in life, every issue, will flow right out of this prayer. Jesus said it all in 66 words. Seven keys to everything you require for overcoming in every area of your life. And if you will do this every day, every morning, his blessings will flow into every part of your life. You'll discover for yourself the secret of Jesus' own life. Jesus went from one place of prayer to the next, and in between, the power flowed. You want the power of God in your life? Right here is how you get it. This was Jesus' whole life. And you know where he wants to take you, ma'am? You know where he wants to take you, sir? You know where he wants to take you, young person? To only one place. The place of prayer and communion with him. To such a place in him that where when you get up every morning, you pray until you're so full of him, that your very life is just breathing out the life of the Spirit. When you walk out into your world, everywhere you go, people will ask, what is that all over you? You don't get this from Bible college. You don't get this from seminary. In fact, you can lose this at seminary if you're not careful. I spent 11 years of my life in Bible college and seminary, and as useful and meaningful as that was, it didn't teach me this. Where did I get it? I found it in a solitary place, alone with my father. I set my face like a flint and said, Lord, teach me to pray. And I'm asking the Holy Spirit to take this and just thrust it into your heart like a spear of revelation. Let it drive itself into your heart and let it change you forever. Let's just bow our heads together, but let's not move out of what's happening right now. The Lord is speaking to your heart. Folks, anyone can do this. A little child can do this. It's not for super saints, but it's the only way you'll ever become one. Father, I pray right now that my sharing has not been in vain, but, oh God, today you have sent me in your word to this people right here, right now. This is a today word from your Holy Spirit, and today we hear your voice. And we will not harden our hearts by refusing to heed it. In Jesus' mighty name. We trust this message from the Word of God has been a blessing to you and made you think. If you need further information, you can find us on the web at www.obedientfaith.net. That's obedientfaith.net. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, or you may write to us at Dr. Larry L. Yates, 738 Goodson Circle, Mineola, Texas, 75773. Whether it's a question, 
prayer request or praise report, we want to hear from you. When you partner with us, you are helping to share God's love and redemptive message of hope around the world. If you have enjoyed this message, don't forget to subscribe and join us each week here for more Time in the Word. Thank you for joining us, and don't forget, read your Bible, read it slow, read every word, and read it like you've never read it before. Now go and have a blessed day in Jesus' mighty name.